It's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to King's for this discussion of the outcomes and implications of the recent general elections in India. Um, my name is Louise Tillin. I'm a, a politics lecturer here at the India Institute, um, and I am particularly delighted to welcome a very distinguished panel for this discussion. I must say, when we organised this event for June the 11th, I felt that we would all be exhausted by post-election analysis by now. But having had a day of discussions already, I think we're still raring to go. There's still much um, that is left for us to understand, both about the results themselves, but also, perhaps more importantly, for our discussion tonight and for the longer term about their implications. So to introduce our panel, um, to my right, Professor Suhaj Palshikar, uh, who we're very pleased has been able to join us from India today. Uh, Suhas is Professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Pune. He's the head of the Lokniti Network, um, who conduct India's most reliable uh, source of data for election junkies, the National Election Studies. Um, and so we're, we're, we're very glad he could join the panel. He's also the chief editor of a new journal uh, that Lokniti have established, the uh, Journal Studies in Indian Politics, um, which is a great addition um, to the field. To my left, Professor Sudipta Kavaraj, uh, who is Professor of Indian Politics and Intellectual History at Columbia University, and we're also very blessed uh, that he could be in town um, for this discussion. Uh, Professor Christoph Jaffrelo, to my far right, uh, is well known to many of you at King's. Uh, Professor Jaffrelo holds a joint professorship here at the India Institute and at Sciences Po in Paris. Um, and he is, as many of you know, one of the foremost scholars of Hindu, nation of Hindu nationalism and the politics of caste in India. Um, and he is, uh, along with myself and several other colleagues, a convener of a major India-European research network on um, explanations of electoral change in urban and rural India. And last but certainly not least, uh, to my far left, Professor James Mayner, Professor Emeritus at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies the at the University of London, um, a very good friend of the India Institute and one of the most eminent authorities on Indian politics that we have in this country. So um, very glad to have you on the, on the panel tonight as well. I shan't do too much, by the way, of preliminaries uh, in introducing this panel because I think the rudimentary, rudimentary lines of the election outcomes are by now fairly well known. The scale of the BJP's victory took most observers by surprise, even though a BJP-led BJP -led government had appeared a likelihood for some time as the incumbent Congress-led United Progressive Alliance had rapidly run out of steam, discredited discredited by a string of corruption scandals and botched attempts at bold decisions designed to break a perception of paralysis at the heart of government. Yet what the BJP, led by Narendra Modi, achieved was more of an earthquake than, than had been anticipated, included, including by many of us. For the first time in 30 years, a single national party was able to win a clear majority of seats on its own. The era of coalition government bringing together national and regional parties in a fragmented polity where the states have become the prim primary economic and political movers appears to have been shaken. And yet there are many reasons to still the hyperbole around these elections and look for continuities as well as the changes that we see in the ele electoral outcomes. While these elections are critical in that they have disrupted the stable patterns of recent decades, we don't know yet whether they represent a longer-term break. Furthermore, there remain major pressing questions about how Narendra Modi will use and interpret his mandate. He has, of course, famously adopted the maxim of minimum government and maximum governance, but how this will work or look in practice remains to be seen, where checks and balances will come from, and how a leader with centralising proclivities will interact with India's institutions. While Modi effectively kept to a script focused on governance and development in the elections, there were many other indications that others in, others in the party and in the broader family of Hindu nationalist organisations remain committed to older scripts. And our panel tonight will help us to think through some of the potential longer term implications of these elections and help, I think, to provide some analytical frames through which we can seek to understand currently unfolding events. So without any further ado, I would like to invite Professor Palshika uh, to 
um, make uh, some preliminary remarks, and then we'll, we'll pass over to other members of the panel. Professor Pacheco. Louis, my co-panelists and friends, it's indeed a great pleasure to be with you this evening and to try and tease out some of the issues that have arisen out of the recent outcome of the 16th parliamentary elections in India. The BJP, the party that has won the election, it has one clear majority on its own, having helped its allies on its way to victory. It has also recorded the largest vote share since 1991 for a ruling party. Rarely could one think of elections throwing up discourse of mandate during the past quarter of a century. In fact, a working legislative majority was also not a feature of many governments of the last 25 years. So this is probably for the first time in the last 25 years that both observers and analysts of Indian politics have an opportunity of trying to find out what is the mandate about, but more importantly, how the mandate would be read and understood by those who are supposedly the winners of that mandate. That is the BJP, the ruling party in India today. Well, this election was and is different for a number of reasons. The BJP's victory it came after a long-drawn and concerted campaign focusing on a specific theme, the theme called development, which in itself was something new to Indian political discourse, though there also were a number of other supplementary themes, such as corruption, non-governance. Louis already had made mention of some of them in her introductory remarks, and so on. However, the idea of development seems to have captured the imagination of the electorate. Along with that, there has also been a huge surge in personality cult in favor of the present Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi. When Modi was named as the Prime Minister by his party as the Prime Minister candidate, not many believed that he can actually win this election so easily. However, as our election studies started tracking the public opinion since June, 19, uh, June 2013, we found that initially one-fifth of the electorate named or favored Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister. And this number swelled to 34 percent by January 2014, four, uh, four months ahead of the elections. In the sense, therefore, this personality cult or favor, uh, the uh, opinion in favor of one person, leader seems to be the clinching issue in these elections. Comparing with Indira Gandhi, I have already argued recently that this was a first kind of plebiscitary election in the last 25 years in which a leader sought a plebiscite on his own personal <coughs> leadership in order to win an election for himself and his party. Amidst exultations for the time being, therefore, the BJP has not come up with any concrete statement about what they mean by this mandate. We are therefore left with conjecture, expectations, or apprehensions. Though it is tough to decide what the mandate is, in the campaign itself, Modi repeatedly mentioned that his government would be inclusive, it would not exclude any sections of the society. Secondly, as Louis also pointed out, his government would be for development and governance. The trouble, however, is which Modi do we look forward to? The one that was presented in the campaign? Or the one who talked about dreams and achievements? Or the one who related his tea vendor and backward caste background? or the one who is projected by the media as a changed person from a controversial Modi of 2002-2003. That's the riddle that this mandate presents us with. But apart from the persona of Modi, the election could also be read as a mandate for what the BJP intended to do. 
Often, reminders of its record in Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh are given to suggest that, after all, BJP would be a party of governance rather than a party of chaos like the Congress and UPA led by the Congress for the past five years or ten years. But even then, there would be three choices before the BJP and before its supporters to read this mandate, to understand and decipher this mandate. Is it governance? Is it about governance? Or is it about economic restructuring? Or is it about social reconstruction? <coughs> After all, most of us know that the BJP is a party which believes in Hindutva or Hindu nationalism. Has it given it up? Will also be a question in reading this mandate. Modi and BJP may be tempted, I suspect, to overread the mandate. A modest reading will take away the shine that the mandate has, and therefore they would not like to do that. A modest reading of the mandate would mean that the drama surrounding the mandate disappears. It would be therefore fascinating to watch which way Modi will go. As I said, these are the three ways Modi can go. And by Modi, I also mean the Modi-led government, not just Modi as a person. Governance. A lot of talk about governance is happening everywhere. And of course, all of you would agree that governance is a beautiful term. In academic discussions, one rarely finds adequate agreement on what governance means, though it is very profusely used in academic discourse. It is even more hazy and therefore much more attractive in public discussions. Nevertheless, improvement in mechanisms and regulation and distribution would always help, and therefore ordinary citizens would always look to look forward to certain ideas of governance. That task would, of course, be boring. Just to reform government, to make the country better governed, could actually be a very boring task. It would be a long-term task. It would be less media savvy. And therefore, we don't know whether Modi would go for that. To begin with, more about style and less about substance might start happening in the field of governance. Modi and BJP may seek to return to an imperial prime minister, on the other hand, which has already started happening. Some of you might have noted, for example, that in the notification issued describing the portfolio distribution of the new cabinet, an important point has been made, and that is the PM is assigned with all important policy issues. That is one of the tasks assigned to the prime minister. It, in a sense, is fit in the fitness of the things because, in any case, people have elected Modi as a strong leader, so they look forward to Modi as a strong leader as well. <clears throat> I might also mention that this craving for the strong leader is something that we need to watch out for. In 2004, we had done a study which showed that 44 percent of the citizens of India said that they would like a strong leader to run the country's government. This number rose to 53 in 2013 when Modi's candidature was announced to be the prime minister. So there must be some link between the style of functioning that Modi adopts and this national craving for a strong leader to sort of clean out the chaos that politics has created. So that would probably be one way for Mr. Narendra Modi and his party. The other would be economic restructuring. Already there has been some discussion in Indian newspaper circles about the economic restructuring that Mr. Narendra Modi's government should and might bring about. For some reason, development has these days become a preserve of the economists. And an economist that I'm going to quote, for example, also is clueless about what Modi is going to do about the economy. A famous economist who is tipped to be the economic advisor and also recommended a testimonial has been issued by another economist that he be the economic advisor to the new prime minister. So this economist, Arvind Panagaria, has actually written eloquently about how Modi sleeps only for three hours and therefore has a lot of time to think about economic restructuring and the future of the country. This comes bang on the next day of the election results 
in the Times of India on 17th May. In fact, this economist says that if 1977 was an election about political freedom, 2014 is an election about economic freedom. Such a reading of the mandate would surely bring about new confrontations between the idea of right-based welfare on the one hand and the idea of growth on the other hand. As Pangaria's article itself says, this election was a response to progressively greater government intrusion into the lives of people through extensions of the rights approach to housing, entrepreneurship, and health, rather than empowering them directly through growth and development. If this is going to happen, then there is certainly going to be a new area of contestation and confrontation in the country in the times ahead. So that's the second, second route that uh, the government might take and Mr. Narendra Modi might opt for. Yet another reading of the mandate could be in the context of BJP's well-known insistence on Hindutva and Hindu nationalism. This election did not see BJP emphasizing Hindutva in its campaign directly, not Modi himself certainly. He didn't say much about Hindutva during the election campaign. <coughs> However, the need he need not be actually speaking about Hindutva, because he has already been identified with a certain version of Hindutva in the last decade or so. Quite a bit of logical prowess would be required to decipher Modi's Hindutva, however. But when he was elected, chosen as the prime minister candidate for the BJP, he started giving interviews to national media and the press. And in one of those, he says that Hindutva is same as nationalism which has always been a consistent line of the Hindutva parties in India, that Hindutva is nationalism in Indian context. What Modi adds to it, however, is that my nationalism means development. So then you start running around in the circles because you are running for development, but development means nationalism, and nationalism means Hindutva. It is in this sense that there is a connect between Hindutva and nationalism in this election and the times to come. It is for this reason that this mandate could also be overread, enthusiastically overread by supporters of Modi and by Modi himself to mean that he has now a mandate for social reconstruction. Uh, another columnist, in fact, has already said that this was not a mandate for consensus. Please uh, listen. This was not a mandate for consensus, but for audacity. The question, of course, is audacity for what? And therefore, I think that either the Modi government would restrict itself only to governance issues, and thus, therefore, lose its shine and drama. Or on the other hand, the Modi government might overread the mandate and go for either economic restructuring or social reconstruction on a somewhat more risky path, not that these are not happening, because as I have myself argued earlier also, there has been a certain normative framework in this country, in India, about how politics should be conducted. And Modi is much more a product of that new normative framework rather than someone who seeks to reshape that framework. The question only is this, how far Modi would actually try to reshape and redefine the existing middle ground of politics and how far he would limit himself to run and conduct his politics within the given framework. These are some of the issues that we might have to ponder about and may also have to watch carefully as the Modi government gets on going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Balshika. And I now turn to Professor Coveraj. Um, Thank you. <coughs> Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I'm not uh, especially a student of elections, so uh, it's hard for me to follow on uh, Suhash's wonderful analysis of the election, both from the point of view of what happened in the elections and what we can uh, expect from it. 
So I would give you some sort of general remarks uh, about how I see the election as an ordinary Indian citizen, but with deep interest in politics. I fear that this election will make us encounter a historical feature of democracy, which we haven't encountered before in India. In one sense, we say that we are very familiar with democracy, which we are, in a sense. But one feature of democracy, the volatility of government, the possibility of really fundamental change in the orientation of government itself. I don't think in India, in spite of 70 years of democracy, we have encountered something like this. Now, the first point I want to think about a little bit, which is a slightly more theoretical point, is that uh, I do not know really who won the Indian election. <coughs> this is not just a rhetorical point, because I think in an election, there are two types of people who are winners of elections. Some people who are the winners of elections are the candidates. And that is the easier part. We all understand, uh, know, who won the election, Modi or BJP or individual candidates. But I think it's not uh, you know, a platitude to say that there are also a second set of people who are also winners of elections. Actually, those are the real winners of elections because it's because they win that the candidates win, they go to office, which is the people who voted in large numbers for a particular party and put them into power. Now, what I, the reason I'm emphasizing this is that I think it, these people are much more inscrutable in a sense. It's much harder to understand who voted the BJP into power and why they voted them into power. But I think, I think it's an important uh, question. Now, if we want to understand wh which direction Indian politics is going to take uh, in the middle term future, we can do that by looking at three or four different things, the nature of the party, the nature of the candidate, the nature of the campaign, and the nature of some of the initial moves that have been made by Modi and his associates in government. I would leave aside the party. Let me also make another point very quickly. There is a well-established theory in comparative politics which says that if there's a very radical party or an extreme party, one way of taming it, one way of sort of putting it under control is to put it in government. In fact, if it stays in government, the longer it stays in government, the more de-radicalized the party becomes. I'm not saying that that's not possible in India, because I really believe that institutions have a real causal force. And it's quite possible that you know, the BJP, in order to stay in government, will have to respond to that. And the causal force of democratic institutions would actually force it to moderate itself. I would not go into the question of the BJP. I'll focus on these three things, the candidate, the campaign, and uh, his first moves. <coughs> so the candidate, who is Modi? Although it has been, it, it, there has been a lot of writing about Modi very recently, I think we do not know enough about Modi, because he, particularly because of the meteoric character of his rise. I was in India in March 2013, and I don't think if somebody said that Modi is going to be the next prime minister of India, I would have actually even taken it seriously, because it didn't uh, seem plausible. And uh, so I think the the quickness you know, with which this has changed is something which is interesting and which requires analysis. I'll tell you what I find, uh, what causes concern to me about uh, Mr. Modi. The first one, I'll give you one or two rather you know, casual examples and then go into things which are more serious. Uh, he went, when there was this deluge in Uttarakhand, he went to Gujarat, uh, he went there, and apparently with the express intention of plucking the Gujaratis out of the flood, which I find uh, disturbing. Uh, he says that you know, he's the creator of the Gujarat model. I think if there is a Gujarat model, I think there is something to be said about that. Gujarat is actually one of the most prosperous, country, prosperous regions of the country. But I think that is more a historical rather than a political fact. The Gujaratis have been doing well as a region and as good businessmen since the time of Taverni, at least. So it cannot be attributed to Modi's skills. The more serious thing is that um, I think Modi became the candidate of the BJP because of something which is important to analyze. I believe that out of the different political parties in India, 
Uh, BJP was the party which functioned more democratically than others. Uh, to my mind, more, BJP functioned more democratically than Congress, than the SP, some of the left parties, etc. if you take democracy in its most ordinary meaning. But I think the selection of Modi as the prime ministerial candidate was interesting because I think it indicates that there was an internal contest in the BJP about the massacres in Gujarat in, 19, in 2002 and what the BJP was going to do about that in future. And I believe that one section of the BJP seriously believed that if the BJP as a party did not so show some sense of serious contrition about that, then the BJP would never be able to come to power. At the other side, which was led paradoxically by uh, Advani and the older leadership of the BJP. Now, Modi was picked up and run by a group of people who disagreed and who believed that it was possible to win the election without taking that direction at all. And I think in doing so, what they did was, as I was saying in the morning, they did to the BJP what Mrs. Gandhi, in my view, did to the Congress in 1969-71. That is, she changed the relationship between the party and the leader. Instead of a reorganized, revitalized party uh, bringing the leader back to power, you know, the Congress. I think what happened during the election of 1971 was that the leader brought the party back to power. I'm not saying that the BJP and Modi are exactly the same, but I think there's a tendency it, which might go in that direction. Now, two or three points about Modi's, <coughs> how Modi is viewed, or what I can see in Modi. I find his response to the challenge of corruption uh, disturbing, because it seems that uh, if a businessman says that I <clears throat> have enormous difficulty in getting <coughs> getting a clearance, I go to Mr. Modi, and he clears the, uh, the thing for me in two days. I don't think that is actually the mark of, his, of an efficient administration. That is actually a technique of bypassing the administration by concentrating power in one section of, of the government, which is very different from an efficient administration. I think producing an efficient administration in India, partly because of the Congress <coughs> heritage, is very hard. Suhas has al already said that you know some people want to see a kind of China-type leadership from him, which fits in with this kind of thing. And finally, a last point about this candidate. He's the first chief minister who has become the prime minister of India in a serious sense. And I think there might be trouble because of this, because India, he might be tempted to do for India what he has done for Gujarat, which might actually lead to suboptimal consequences, because although India is composed of states, in itself, it is actually unlike any one of them. Now I want to turn to the campaign. <coughs> what struck me about the campaign was a combination of intensity and vagueness. Uh, Modi has promised everything to everyone, and remarkably, the manifesto was published at a time when nobody had the time to read it. And he has also said, I think interestingly, uh, when he was asked a question by somebody that governments run not by manifestos, but by constitutions. I think by that, he has actually uh, got a certain kind of, you know, sort of leeway for himself. We have to see how it goes. But I think this combination of intensity and vagueness is very important. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it is well known that this kind of campaign, which has the advantage at the campaign level of drawing in support from every side, the Congress also did that quite often, <clears throat> has the attendant difficulty that when you come to power and you have to deliver, it makes it it makes governance, you know, sociological governance, very difficult because you cannot give everything to everybody. So I expect some difficulty coming from that direction. Secondly, I want to notice that Modi campaign, uh, Modi ran a remarkably double campaign. It's true that in his own campaign, he did not raise the question of Gujarat or communalism <coughs> or minorities. But I don't think it was something which was absent from the campaign altogether. There were some people who are close associates of Mr. Modi who raised it viciously, repeatedly, and insistently in the election campaign. So it was not something which had faded. 
It was actually partially strategically faded from certain parts of the campaign. And the other thing which is linked to that, which we should remember, is the very peculiar timing you know, of the Muzaffarnagar riots, very close to the election to give comfort to anyone who is um, an observer. <coughs> Finally, one thing about the campaign, which is not just a fault of Narendra Modi or the BJP, the use of the media, uh, what happened in the public sphere is that in a functioning democracy, we need a public sphere which allows different positions to be articulated in terms of arguments and people to choose between them for themselves. I think you would agree with me probably that what happened in the public sphere this time was not like that at all. The public sphere was completely overwhelmed rather than it, instead of, what I mean is that instead of winning an election, he simply overwhelmed everybody else so that we didn't have much exchange of, uh, you know, serious political arguments in this election. Now the first moves that we have seen from Narendra Modi, he has flagged in his acceptance speech three very contentious issues. Article 370, a uniform civil code, and occasionally in his speeches, uh, for instance in West Bengal, he has actually said ominous things about Bangladesh should pack their bags because when he comes he should actually send them back and things like that. Now all these say two things. They say what they say literally, but they're also coded sort of anti-Muslim slogans of long standing. But I think uh, I'm not uh, saying that you know this would be the agenda of the government right from the first day. I'll tell you why I'm a bit concerned about that a bit later. Some of the appointments that he has made recently might show that he might seek efficiency rather than a kind of polarization. Uh, but the command that no one should talk to the media is a kind of Indira Gandhi style of move, which I find uh, a bit a matter of concern. The likely difficulties, just, uh, just one minute. <coughs> I think he might find it difficult to seriously tackle the problem of corruption. Because as I said, the way he promised to tackle corruption, to my view, would not tackle the kind of embedded corruption we have in India. Secondly, Given his inclinations, he might actually go into, not, uh, not in a communal sense, but otherwise into an anti-diversity direction, which would bring him into very serious clash with state governments and state chief ministers, including chief ministers of his own party, who do not actually simply want to lie down and give up their careers simply because he's in power. And, uh, <coughs> but what do I expect out of this? Let me make just two points very quickly. The first point is that I do not expect that this government would immediately swing into polarizing moves of various kinds. But my fear is that if after some time, as Mrs. Gandhi experienced in 1971, because of certain moves, uh, it gets into difficulty. Mrs. Gandhi got into difficulty within three years. In four years, she was prepared to declare the emergency. The crisis was so deep. So if this government faces difficulties, my fear mm -hmm. is that it might actually then turn on an, a polarizing agenda, which it has actually kept in the background in a certain sense. So my last point would be this, that I do not know, as I said, who are the winners of the Indian election in the second sense. And when, uh, with unfolding of time, with the change of political circumstances, with different policies which are taken by the government, the situation would change, undoubtedly. And because of that, the circles of support which have converged on Narendra Modi and the BJP now, it's likely to separate off after some time. And what would happen after that, I think, would be the real test of this government. I do not see uh, exactly what would happen. And uh, this is something that I fear, and I think it is possible. But in politics, of course, it's famously said that the opposite of what is possible is also possible. That's politics. Thank you. Thank you, Sudipta. Um, and now, Christoph, uh, if I may. Thank you, Louise. In a way, I'm going to revisit the issues Suash and Sudipto have dealt with uh, by focusing on 
the Hindu uh, nationalist movement, the, the Song River, and, and that way I will probably save five minutes and therefore um, will be on time since I'll have to leave before the end. <laughs> uh, the Song River, of course, is the background of Narendra Modi, and uh, traditionally this organization or this movement uh, has been above men. The um, personality of the RSS chiefs hardly mattered in the past and don't matter today either to such an extent that we do not remember who were the Sassan Chalaks of the RSS over the last uh, few decades. The movement was started in 1925 and uh, that was due to the fact that the founder, Ed Gavar, did not want to be the mentor, but preferred to have the saffron flag as the guru, because men die, the guru is eternal, at least this one, this, uh, this flag that is used on the, on the shaka. There is a strong philosophy behind, and we can return to that in the discussion if you want, but it is, it is clearly different from many European movements which were embodied by the leader. And this philosophy was replicated in the BGP and before that in the Janasong, the parties the RSS supported, to such an extent that when Baraj Madok, the Janasong leader in the 60s, became too strong and wanted to promote his own person too much, he was eased out and replaced by Vajpayee and Advani, who collegially ran the party for 40, 40 years almost. And this collegiality was very much the, the trademark of the leadership in the BGP. Things have changed a great deal. And we have now, with the rise of Narendra Modi, a new kind of modus operandum. He explicitly said during the election campaign that this time the voters might have to vote for an MB, but in fact it was for him that the vote was solicited. And uh, you, might, you may also remember the way uh, the uh, UP state um, BGP apparatus was short-circuited by Amit Shah, his right-hand man, when he took over from uh, the local, um, usual, regular um, leaders. So men, at least one man, prevailed more than before. And the RSS was obviously uncomfortable with this cult of the personality. To such an extent that uh, the RSS chief, um, Bhagwat, told the Soyam Sevaks that they did not need to chant Namo because they are not supposed to indulge in this kind of cult. And to such an extent that some of the slogans were withdrawn. You may remember this one, Ar Ar Modi, Gar Gar Modi. That was something clearly uh, in uh, the brand of this kind of cult, and that was withdrawn uh, after it was also criticized by one, uh, one Shankaracharya saying that this is what the Shavites say when they say Ar Ar Mahadev. Um, Modi is not Mahadev. That was clearly the conclusion, the RSS, the, the message the RSS wanted to convey. So the RSS was uncomfortable with this kind of leadership, but resigned itself to this leadership. And that's a very interesting change in the way the RSS is dealing with the BGP and with politics at large. Well, this change, this shift of the RSS took place when Narendra Modi was chief minister of Gujarat. To begin with, the RSS resisted the way Narendra Modi was operating and uh, criticized the way he did not report to the RSS. Usually, a BGP chief minister shows the list of the candidates he is fielding for the state elections. He never did it. But he went away with it, and when there was a clash between the Pran Pracharak of the RSS in Gujarat and Narendra Modi, the Pran Pracharak was sent to Chennai. Um, and similarly, when Modi did not pay respect to his predecessor, a very senior BGP leader, Keshubhai Patel, um, Patel had to go and form his own party. So 
repeatedly we saw the RSS bowing to a man who theoretically on the paper was not was not of their liking. Why? Well, for probably many different reasons. First, Modi probably did not need the RSS as much as his predecessors because he had built its own parallel power structure. And he had started to do that when he was the state organizer of the BGP in the 80s, 90s. Secondly, probably because Modi had galvanized the RSS full soldiers to such an extent that the RSS leaders could not ignore their cadres, could not ignore their activists. They wanted these activists a new candidate, did not want to support LK Advani again. They wanted a better, a better candidate this time. Thirdly, we could go on for, uh, on this, but I say it in one sentence, Narendra Modi had and has resources financial resources that were necessarily uh, valuable. And last but not least, and that's the most important point, in some ways, Narendra Modi shares the worldview of the RSS much more obviously than many other BGP leaders, including Atal Bihari Vajpayee and LK Advani, the LK Advani who uh, held Gina the secularist. Uh, these, these commonalities, you know, the the real affinities between uh, Narendra Modi's ideology and the RSS ideology are, of course, a very important dimension. But Narendra Modi cannot and does not want to implement the worldview of the RSS now. He cannot and doesn't want to do it because his priority is the economy. His priority is to relaunch the economy to get a good growth rate again. And if he indulges in the articles of faith of the RSS, which are a Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, abolition of Article 370, a uniform civil code, and many other items of, of that kind, he opens Pandora boxes, which will be distractions, which will result in agitations, and that will somewhat derail, or may derail, the uh, main policy that has to be economy-oriented. So how will this be reconciled? How will the RSS accept to support a prime minister who shares the same ideas but do not implement them? Well, first, probably, Narendra Modi can make concessions which will diffuse tensions. There are many things that which can be done and which have already started to be done. Just to give a short list, the rewriting of history textbooks, the appointment of RSS men at the helm of very prestigious institutions, and when some of the um, people at the helm of these students will retire or go, we will see new faces emerging coming from the RSS milieu. And of course, the upgrading of the security apparatus, that is something very dear to the art of the RSS. <clears throat> these concessions will do till Narendra Modi will not need the RSS too much. And that, of course, will work till it will be popular. And uh, that means that if the economy creates jobs, if the inflation rate, a very important variable, is reduced, then it will not need too much RSS people conversing for him at the time of the next elections. But if that doesn't happen, and if he has to fall back on a kind of B plan, then it will be a different story. And um, <coughs> That may happen before the, net, the next general elections. That may also happen at the time of state elections. And we'll have to keep an eye on, these, on this schedule of state elections. The elections that will take place in BR at the end of next year will be probably one of these occasions when you may need to activate other 
resources and not only the personality of the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. And lastly, we have Professor Maynard. Yes, I managed to uh, twist my back, believe it or not, uh, getting on this stage. And it's a back that uh, sometimes behaves very badly. So I, just to, to keep things on even keel, if you don't mind, I'll speak sitting here. I don't think you'll lose too much. In Britain, if a, a political party wins a huge majority at a, at a parliamentary election, it is usually said, correctly by the way, that it will take the opposition at least two general elections to recover. It won't happen, won't be turned around completely the next time. There are complicated reasons why that is true, but it, this is not true of India. In India, we've seen uh, three elections before this one in which one party wins huge uh, sweeping victories. 1971, Mrs. Gandhi won on the promise to abolish poverty. 1977, the opposition defeated Mrs. Gandhi uh, on the promise to uh, kill off the autocratic uh, remnants of the emergency. And in 1984, Mrs. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi's Congress party won a, a landslide, the biggest landslide ever, by the way, uh, after uh, a trauma uh, on a sympathy vote after the assassination of his mother. Uh, this is the fourth such sweep. The thing to notice about the previous three sweeps is that at the next election, in every case, the sweeping victorious party was thrown out. So it, the pattern that prevails in this country is not the pattern that prevails in India. <clears throat> now let's, let's take a little bit of uh, a look at uh, some more um, recent history uh, in India and at two recent phases in India's political history. First, uh, for most of the period between 1971 and 1989, under Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi, power was radically centralized in the Prime Minister's office in an, in an attempt to promote one-person rule. <clears throat> and this damaged and weakened other democratic institutions at the national level, all manner of democratic institutions. It also weakened uh, state governments in the federal system and the federal system's structures themselves. Uh, it also weakened institutions outside government, political parties, including the Gandhi's own party. They actually tried to weaken their own party and able to, in order to have more influence personally, and they weakened associations, uh, organizations associated with their, their party. And they weakened civil society organizations wherever possible, and they tried to weaken the media with some success. That's phase, the first of the phases, 71 to 89. The second phase uh, comes along, 89 to 2014, which is quite different. In this phase, no single political party can win a majority in parliament. Massive power, therefore, flows away from the prime minister's office, where it had been concentrated, to other institutions at the national level, all manner of institutions, and they are regenerated, re uh, rebuilt as a result of this, uh, de uh, this flow, dispersal of power to them. Power also flows away from the prime minister's office to governments and parties at the state level, uh, abuses of power by Indian prime ministers almost entirely cease in this period so that between 1989 and, uh, 19, and 2014, India witnessed far fewer abuses of prime ministerial power than the United Kingdom witnessed under either Margaret Thatcher or Tony Blair. There should be a governance officer in the Indian High Commission to explain to the British people how this is possible. Uh, and after 1989, what we see then is the decentralization of power, a major theme in the political system as a whole. But that trend, decentralization, is attended at the same time by a huge irony. For complicated reasons, at the state level, in state governments in India, in many but not all states, we witness 
a centralization of power taking place in this period. So that today, by my reckoning at least, about 60% of the people of India live under state governments in which one leader exercises personal dominance or near dominance. In five Indian states, all big states, the centralization of power has been radical, not just, you know, modest. Chief ministers in these five states have acquired so much power that other institutions beside the chief minister's office have been weakened as institutions were under Mrs. Gandhi when the prime minister's office was so strong. The five states where centralization of this kind, radical centralization, has taken place are Andhra Pradesh, where first uh, Mr. Naidu centralized power. He was the pioneer in this game. Then uh, when he was defeated, uh, YS uh, Rajasekhar Reddy um, did the same thing. And then after a hiatus, when uh, Rajasekhar Reddy died in a plane crash, there was a hiatus, and now Naidu's back. And we can depend on this, the old habits reasserting themselves, I suspect. In West Bengal, Mamta Banerjee governs in this manner, radically centralizing power. In Orissa, or Odisha, if you prefer, Naveen Patnaik does the same. In Tamil Nadu, Jai Lalita does it. And in Gujarat, until recently, Mr. Modi did it. They govern these five people in some respects in quite different ways. They're not all alike. But there is a common theme, and the common theme is the radical centralization of power in their personal hands. Now, since the election, at the national level, we appear to be moving into a new era, a third phase of re-centralization after the decentralization that has occurred since 89. We have a ruling party with a solid majority for the first time since 89. Significant powers will inevitably flow back to the Prime Minister's office, even if the Prime Minister does nothing to encourage the flow. Uh, but we must ask whether the Prime Minister will take action to radically centralize power, as he did in Gujarat, and to govern in the same way that he did in Gujarat, which is to say, to seek to govern, to exercise a kind of personal rule. We also need to ask whether the trend seen in Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, Orissa, Tamil Nadu, and Gujarat, which entails a weakening of other institutions, government institutions, and non-governmental institutions, whether that trend will now uh, also be visible at the national level. The only way that these things will not happen is if Mr. Modi departs from the habits that he has pursued with utter consistency, without any exception, throughout his career. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, everyone's done so well at keeping to time that we have a very decent uh, half hour now for questions and answers, and I'd like to take questions in rounds. Um, so if anyone would like to go first, and particularly I should highlight the fact that Christoph has to leave us at quarter past. So if you have burning questions for Christoph, now is your moment. Yes. I'll... I think the focus is correctly then on some possible threats to the quality and even the existence of democracy in India. Now, I've been trying to think about in the last eight weeks or so, uh, what are the possible sources of resistance to majoritarian democracy uh, in India, uh, for majoritarian democracy that, that would be a threat to actual democracy? One source of resistance uh, really comes from my reading of a Lachmanetic poll that I participated with the Gender and the Wang Mims and the Lachmanetic, and that's what 87% of the people in Sri Lanka who are Sinhalese felt that they were part of the majority. When we asked in India what percentage of the Hindus in India are part of the majority, only 42% said they were. Uh, now, the, what this means is that if plan A fails, which everyone's talked about as being uh, economic development, plan B, everyone suggests, is going to be Hindu. But plan B, uh, it's 
you, we have to raise questions. Can you really pull off the majoritarianism of a plan B if the majority of the population don't really feel that, that they're majoritarians, they're not part of it? The fact is, it would appear to me that, uh, that for, me, uh, for many reasons over the last hundred years, and particularly over the last uh, the period of democracy, building up to it, people recognize that if it is going to work, it cannot work with any false sense of majority. It has to work with, you have to create something where a lot of different people can go together. So I, I think majority, authoritarian majoritarianism probably may, may not exist. I would love to hear, uh, not so much what people think of that, because I think, I think that's the idea. But are there two or three or four other sources of existence? Because all the talk has been about threats, which is absolutely important. But it's also important to expand our imagination so that we can think about and some people can cultivate sources of resistance to this type of majoritarianism. Thank you. Okay, I see several hands now. Uh, yes, it would like. Just to read the point about the regional parties, um, I remember in the uh, session here about two months ago, the view was expressed that regional parties were likely to get squeezed uh, in the election. And while that happened, in other areas, and they've still got they've got 50 percent of the vote. Um, and to what extent, you know, does this does this matter? That's basically it. I thought of Professor Manners' last point about the, I mean, those very powerful chief ministers who are still in place. You know, to what extent is really going to have to work with them and, and check on them? I, the, the, the real is the issue too, obviously, of the fact that um, he doesn't have a majority in the upper house. That clearly, with state elections, that could change. And I think the second point is just the, the elephant in the room, as you mentioned, which is actually the future of Congress. Um, you know, whether it has a future, and uh, to what extent. I mean, the difference between I think those three landslides of 71, 77, 84. It's since 84 that we've seen the rise of the regional parties. Is it going to be so easy for Congress to come back, especially when, you know, basically the opposition is so fragmented? Mm. Thanks. Uh, Chris and then Diego. <clears throat> well, this is a question mainly directed to Christoph, though I'm sure everyone else can answer it too. I mean, one of the important things that happened, of course, in the sort of previous rise <coughs> of the BJP in Dutha was a radical alteration in the camp sociology at the, le of the, of the camp ground level. But Hindu identi religious identities became sharper. Uh, the public sphere became increasingly sort of religified, um, and so on. So, and that, of course, uh, did not reverse when the BJP lost elections. People continued to think of themselves as more sharply Hindu than they previously had. But there's no doubt that over the last decade or so, it has tended to kind of weaken. I mean, there's, there's less aggressive religiosity, I thought, in the sort of ground level than there was. But are we now going to see history repeat itself? That all this kind of um, uh, religious divisiveness at the local level will tend to rise again as it was doing in the previous rise of the BJP? Or is the whole situation we think now different? Um, and it won't be, from that point of view, just a, a rerun of what happened from roughly the time of the demolition of the Iowa Mosque to the Thanks to elections in which the BJP won the majority. Thanks. I'll take a couple more. So I have Jonathan and then Subrata. How much of a mandate, um, or, or your will, do you think Congress has to work to get the majority of the votes in the BJP now? Okay. Subrata? Yeah. Um, I would like to ask Christoph a question about Article 370 and India's relations with the uh, South Asian neighbors. Now, Article 370. Um, is uh, an article in the Constitution of India which starts by saying these are temporary provisions about Kashmir. And the, article, the Constitution was promulgated in 1950, and this is 2014. All these years, that article has remained as a temporary article. The campaign promise of Narendra Modi was to talk about Article 370 and resolve the Kashmir issue uh, once and for all. My question to Christopher is, why has this measure, measure 
remained temporary for 64 years and what does it look like in the near future in terms of a possible solution of this problem uh, between uh, India, Pakistan and Kashmir. Okay, I'm going to give our... Oh, sorry, Diego. <laughs> It's a question to Christoph as well. And if, if, if I were part of a Muslim terrorist organization in India, or if I were part of the certain section of the Pakistan intelligence, I could probably couldn't wait to organize a terrorist strike in India after an intermodist victory. Uh, so do you think this is likely to happen? And in that case, do you think this will call, this will uh, say that Modi will react by implementing Plan B? Uh, Okay, um, I'll give you each a, a, a chance to respond to quite a, 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 a wide-ranging set of questions. Christopher, would you like to yeah, go first? And, and, and probably I'll have to go. Sorry. Um, these Christians uh, are, 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 of course, absolutely key. And uh, we would have said, maybe just before these elections, that one of the antidotes to majoritarianism could be caste. And these elections are showing us that caste politics is now eroding. It can be replaced by class. That's one of the possibilities for resisting this kind of <coughs> majoritarianism, which is, which is elite dominated. When, when you look at the voting pattern, it's very clear that uh, the richer you are, the more BGP oriented you are also. So that's one possibility. Another one, of course, is Federalism, states with strong chief ministers, they can resist effectively. And in fact, in the Lok Sabha itself, we will see probably state parties playing a much bigger role today because there is not even an official leader of the opposition. And I would mention only in the third and last position, institution, institutions which are the custodians of the rule of law. Let's see. Let's see how resisting, how resistant, how resilient are the Supreme Court, the Election Commission, so many institutions. They'll have a role to play, but I'm prepared to believe that politics is more something that goes by numbers than something that goes by laws and by the, the rule of law. <clears throat> Um, if I may continue and, and respond to, to, to Chris, um, yes, it's a, it's a good point that indeed we do not have the kind of aggressive religiosity we, we did have, uh, 92, the division of the Mopoli Majid and so on. At the same time, what could be the attitude of Indudva forces if now there is some opposition to their <coughs> program? What could be their reaction? Now, if after five years there is nothing new in Ayodhya, what, what would be their reaction? The, then you, you can indeed have a repeat of history, as you said, because it would mean that uh, it's not enough to be in office. You have also to be in the street, possibly. Subrato, your question of, on Article 370 um, is, of course, also crucial. And uh, it has to do, as you said, as you suggested, with, with the neighbors, uh, at least one of them. Uh, it's not the only article of this uh, constitution that, is, that, that, that was supposed to be temporary. You know, every 10 years, reservations for serial caste are renewed. So it's not the only article that was supposed to go and, 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 and same for the uh, Uniform Civil Code, I mean, as you, as, you, as you know. So this is something temporary that is now almost structural. Um, here you, you, you have precisely to, to face first the consistency, I, I use the word Jim as, as, as used and it is perfectly relevant, of Narendra Modi. If he's consistent, he'll have to remove it. And that will have repercussions domestically, internationally, and that would be a distraction regarding his priority agenda. Will he be that ideology? Will, will he be that ideology oriented? Will he be more pragmatic? I'm prepared to believe he will be more pragmatic. 
but he'll have also to make efforts. And for instance, when he appoints as a kind of representative of Jammu and Kashmir, someone who is only from Jammu, and who can only say something against Article 370, the, mo the, the very same day he becomes member of the parliament. Well, you have to correct this kind of uh, attitude. And the last point, which is rather provocative, uh, but let's take it like that. Um, well, in a way, it has happened. What happened in Herat, in the uh, Indian consulate in Afghanistan, was probably a good way to test Narendra Modi. Of course, it's a remote place. It could not be eating the headlines in the Indian media. But yes, it makes a lot of sense, especially for Pakistan-based groups, to see how reactive Narendra Modi will be if he is pushed in that direction. I would not say the same thing regarding uh, Muslim, Indian Muslim terrorists. I don't think I don't think they they would they would dare to do that now. There is no reason to do it now. If they do it now, there'll be retaliations and everybody will suffer. Uh, in fact, the big question is how will Muslims be treated, and if they are not well treated because they are not a minority, in the in, in according to the Minister of, of, of Foreign Affairs, will they accept to become second class citizens in their own country? If they do, we are on the way to an ethnic democracy. There are others in the world. Israel is one of them. Why not? If they don't, then your question is become, becomes very relevant. But it's not, for tomorrow. it's not for today. It's for tomorrow or the day after. Thank you, Crystal. So, Hans, would you like to follow up? No? Okay. Thank you. Also, 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 also. Sure. I'll just say a couple of things in response to two questions. Uh, Al Stepan asked about sources of resistance. Uh, well, I, I would, uh, I'll mention one in a moment, but I think to expect resistance, uh, we must take, uh, await actions by the government which might inspire resistance, and we must let uh, those who might resist get over the shell shock of recent events. But what, there, what I think is important to notice is that there are certain impediments, <clears throat> not exactly resistance, but impediments, which stand in the way of uh, um, the kind of worries that you were expressing, majority, uh, autocratic majoritarianism or whatever we call it. Um, and, and one of these uh, impediments, I think, is already evident to you, having written a book about uh, how India is a state nation and not a nation state with Yogendra and uh, Juan Linz. Uh, Indians, be because, because Indian society is so complex, it's the most complex society in the world, Indians have a broader array of uh, identities available to them than any other people on earth. And uh, that includes not just the usual sort of rural, urban, uh, gender, religious, linguistic, uh, uh, class identities, but it includes three different types of caste identities, and the religious identities sometimes include sub-identities within the major identities, etc. Anyway, the Indians, ha and Indians have got a wa very wide array of identities available to them. Uh, but the crucial thing is, is that uh, we know from opinion polling going back 30, 30 or 40 years, and I ask this of Lokniti people all the time uh, when we're not talking about elections. Uh, there's a consistent, there are consistent indications that Indians tend strongly to shift their preoccupations from one of these identities to another, and then to another, maybe back to one of the early ones, then on to another, often and with great fluidity, which is bad news for any political party that seeks to concentrate on their class identity, like the parties of the left, and it's bad news for any party that seeks to concentrate their minds on religious identities, like the Hindu right, for example. And you'll notice the Hindu right in this election campaign, the, Mr. Modi did not stress uh, Hindu nationalist issues. He stressed development, things like that. So, um, because that's the way to win an election. But th th this tendency of Indians to shift their preoccupations, according to recent events, whatever's bothering them at the moment, is different from the people, for example, of Sri Lanka, who have fixed on a single identity. And because of that, uh, it's also a place where religion and uh, 
language tend to reinforce one another, whereas in India, these identities tend to cut across one another. Anyway, because of this, in India, tension and conflict do not build up along a single fault line in society, as they do in Northern Ireland, as they do in Sri Lanka, and certain other places. This is a great blessing, and this fluidity is an impediment to those who might wish to create a sense of majoritarian enthusiasm or resentment uh, in India. Um, so that's an impediment, if not a source of resistance exactly. Now, uh, there is, then there's the question of what Congress can do uh, to uh, react or resist or whatever. Now, Congress is shell-shocked at the moment, and I think we have to give Congress time to, to uh, accommodate itself to reality. Um, there are, however, in, and, and Congress is a mess. I mean, the Congress party is a rabble. Um, Mr. Narasimha Rao called it, uh, it was, he said it's like a railway platform where all sorts of strange people come and go as they like. And I mean, there are other, but other people have had har harsher things to say, and these are all accurate. The Congress party is a, is a mess. However, it does have within it uh, uh, people with uh, promise and brains and who are sensible. And um, there is, for example, uh, a, a set of proposals that's been in the air for years from Digvijay Singh, one of the more brilliant of the congressmen, um, uh, to mount small protests after some time. Let the BJP make some mistakes. Let them do a few things which are perceived to be unjust acts and then, then mount protests, peaceful protests. Uh, but protests which will probably result in large-scale arrests because there will be lots of people in these, pe pe these peaceful, peaceful protests. And what these peaceful protests will end up being, in Digvijay's view, are many satyagrahas. And the, lots of congressmen will be thrown into jail. They will dramatize unjust behavior by government actors. They will gain the kudos that the freedom fighters gain for, for, for protesting against unjust things. Uh, when they're in jail together, the differences between them will be burned away by their shared hardships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This was done, this, this, this strategy brought the Congress to power in Andhra Pradesh in 1989 when Chana Reddy tried it. D.B. Jai Singh has tried it a couple of times. Rahul himself even experimented with it briefly in John C. in a previous election. That's the sort of thing we might see from Congress if it can shake itself out of its torpor. But it has, the high command has made appalling misjudgments in recent times. So who knows where we're headed. Thanks. So Hans, did you want to reflect at all on the resilience of regional parties oh, sure. and that significance? You know, this question about the regional parties and the regional space that is available, it has been already mentioned that there are at least four or five strong regional parties which are in power already. Uh, which can be a major uh, major area of control over the uh, power of the central government. My only worry, however, is that the regional parties, at least these three, four parties, are not really much concerned with the issues which one would like them to be in terms of, for example, the issue of uh, Hindutva or Hindu nationalism. Uh, if you look at just momentarily their behavior in the last 25 years, each one of them has been a partner of the BJP earlier also, including Mamata Banerjee and the AIA DMK in Tamil Nadu and uh, Navin Patnaik in Odisha. Uh, but it's not merely a question of political coalitions. It is also a question of their convictions. And barring probably Mamata Banerjee's compulsions in West Bengal, it is difficult to believe that they would really rise to the occasion and fight against Hindutva communalism. Number two, uh, this uh, more intrusive and aggressive economic restructuring. Again, these parties are not likely to really respond to that in any different manner from what we expect them to be. And therefore, while nominally there is a possibility that these four or five parties might come together and momentarily stall the march of the BJP in parliament uh, in the long run, and that is where I actually ended, my concern is not really with what the BJP would do in the short term, my concern is not about Modi's personality and authoritarian cult that he in, uh, personifies. It's the normative framework within which the public sphere operates in the country, uh, which has already shifted. My argument is that it has already shifted in the last 20 years or so from 
mandal onwards and it has in the sense accommodated unself consciously a hindu majoritarianism so what ali is talking about namely that hindus also have many uh, uh, and fluid identities which is true but at the same time let us not forget that in the last 20 years with the ram janmabhoomi agitation most indian hindus have also unself consciously acquired a hindu majoritarian public ethic and that is the area of concern not the structural existence of regional parties in the short term thank you so Dipta, would you like to say anything on this round or shall we take a further round of questions uh, i wanted to make uh, probably two or three points very quickly. One is the response to Al's question. Uh, what are the forces, rather than resources, which can be ranged against uh, the BJP? I believe that we tend to underestimate the, the forces which might be ranged against the BJP, because I think the BJP's version of Hinduism is opposed not merely to a kind of secularist, modernist uh, you know, ideology of secularism, I have argued that it also goes very deeply, you know, against the logic of conventional, very traditional Hindu worship. So I expect that you know the BJP might come up against uh, difficulty with that. But uh, the difference between these two types of opposition to BJP, I expect, would politically behave quite differently, because the first kind of opposition is much more sort of self-conscious. It's mobilized. It's to my mind, it's uh, sometimes excessively voluble. And the other kind of opposition to BJP, I think, is much more quiescent, uh, much more silent. But uh, nevertheless, I think it is something which is opposed to the BJP. And I think this is uh, an insight which we can get in some of the writings of Ashish Nandi uh, earlier. And uh, Ashish Nandi has written slightly more indirectly about this. The second point. Um, this is more a question about a remark that Christoph made. Unfortunately, Christoph has left, but we discussed this in the morning as well. I'm not, I, I, I'm not willing prematurely to say that caste politics or caste-based uh, mobilization has actually eroded. Because um, I believe that if you look closely at the uh, election figures, you will see that uh, large numbers of people have voted on the basis of caste. The only thing is that this time, their voting has not been very effectual. So I would like to suggest an anal analysis, which is a multi-level analysis. You know, One is the level of voting, and the other one, voting or voting intention, and the other one is the, the efficacy of that voting in terms of actual number of seats, et cetera. And I was asking Suhash uh, earlier, in our earlier discussion, that of course, you know, it, that can also go in two different directions. You know, one can be that their leaders, I'm sure, would come back and tell their constituents that this is just a kind of, you know, one one time uh, problem, and we should cont we should try to figure out, you know, why we did badly. So we continue to vote like that, and if we get our act right, then after some time we would be able to get the kind of result that we did before. The other possibility is that the people who have voted this time and haven't got the results that they expected out of that, they might be unpersuaded by that. They might actually feel skeptical and change their behavior. I do not know how they would, uh, they would operate. But I think it's premature to say that you know, caste-based uh, political mobilization, electoral mobilization, uh, mobilization has ceased. The last point, this is more a question to Jim, because I'm puzzled by this. <coughs> and, I, I wrote about something which struck me as very interesting. I entirely agree with you, and I think it's a very significant observation about Indian politics, that you know how centralized power is and how sort of quasi-authoritarian state governments can become. And because of our excessive emphasis on the central government, we do not pick it up always. But CPM in Bengal, Mamata Banerjee also in Bengal, and it's also quite interesting that despite their difficulties, you know, their electoral, uh, electoral opposition, they inherit these legacies, I think, very willingly and happily. 
so I think there are many parts of India which are dominated by state leaders who are authoritarian in a certain way. Authoritarian will lose, manner of speaking. They are electoral authoritarians in the sense that they believe that the only way to power should be elective. But once you are in power, you should not be bothered by constitution and challenges to, you know, challenges about corruption and things like that. But I, I wanted to mention something else. I think you can argue in a purely rational choice terms that it would be rational for, let's say, seven autocrats, you know, if you can persuade them that they should be together as part of a larger entity, it is quite rational for them to say that we should rule our patch the way we want to. But when we come to the center, the center should be ruled completely democratically because they would not want to lose their power you know, to somebody who is similarly authoritarian and therefore can reduce their power. And I think if you look at the dynamics of Indian politics, I think there has been cases like this. For instance, parties which have been very, very anti-democratic and undemocratic, at least in some ways, in their own states, they have pushed policies which are genuinely democratic and decentralizing at the center. So, but I'm, I'm puzzled by this because I think I have argued also that this was the logic behind Mrs. Gandhi's election as the prime minister because there was no reason why she should have become the prime minister otherwise. None of these other you know, seven or eight magnets in the Congress wanted to see one of them become the prime minister and grind the others down. So they thought that Mrs. Gandhi would be a safe person because she's weak, right? Now, Modi's election is very different. I think Modi is one of those you know, Congress leaders who has actually become the prime minister. So I think the scenario can now be quite different. It could be a scenario like if Moradji Desai became the uh, you know, prime minister in, instead of Mrs. Gandhi. I think the situation is a bit like that. Jim, if you don't mind, I'll take another round of questions and, and come back. Um, so I have one question at the front that I know was waiting last time, and Kartik, I can say at the back. Yeah. So. Uh, yes, one thing which has not been mentioned is the enormous amount of money was spent by the BJP in this election campaign. Now has time to come for payback. Now, will, what form that payback will take? Will it reinforce the present neo-economic you know, development model? And that will not only further increase inequalities, but also poverty. And, and this kind of model does not generate many jobs either. There is a, need for the Indian economy now is 10 million jobs a year. So when Modi talked to in the election about an inclusive form of development, what are the kind of key constituencies that you have to satisfy in order to meet that and thereby reassure his re-election? OK, thanks. A uh, couple of uh, sharp, quick questions from the back. Kartik? Well, mine is related to that. I wanted to pick up on something that uh, Professor Conrad mentioned. You know, the speed of the Modi ascent, you know, which is tied to money, but also the media, and how the media, and especially the politics, sort of play hit by each other, you know, driving the ascent since um, last fall. I mean, it, was, it was not even March. I think it was after September is when that sort of ascent you know, sort of Okay, thanks. And yeah. Is, uh, I read an article by Ram Chandra, <coughs> the historian, one of the historians of India, that just before the uh, general election, that the Congress is going to be finished. Do you think it's finished? Any other burning questions? Uh, I'll take, yep, yeah, one here. Um, uh, I think uh, one thing we did not come into this is, for example, that I think minority, we don't talk about minorities now. Because I think for the last 30 years we have been talking about only minority politics in India, but that has vanished suddenly. So I think what, what has come out of the panel looks like that Hidutva politics is some, somewhere a curse to India. But I think other way, uh, I think if you look at the Indian, England politics, because Bishop of England, I think, he participates into the politics. So somewhere the main religion of the country participates into the politics of the country. So somewhere I want to get this view that why uh, why it cannot be a place with Hindutva kind of government and why it will be a curse. Thanks. And I think, Al, you can have a last word briefly. 
<laughs> I, I absolutely accept uh, James Manner's uh, qualification that it's not coordination, it's not resistance. Coordina uh, resistance requires a lot of coordination. Uh, elections actually produce some coordination because people may be against something. And so I, I have in mind uh, that they might lose the next election. And because I have mine 1971, 1979, 1984, I mean 2019 is not, not that far away. And if they really, if plan A development fails with all of these huge amount of young people coming on the job market and they can't do it, and then they go to um, uh, instead of 10 neutral, that's then the coordination mechanism will be simply people, they can be from five different parties, but if they agree that they would rather be against this, because 31%, let's remind ourselves, that is that is not a huge, it's not a majority. Uh, it's nowhere near a majority. And people could, you can get another group against them. So that's the hope. I mean, it's one. Thanks. Um, I'll give each of our panelists a few minutes just to, to wrap up for any concluding thoughts. I, 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 I'll start with what you were saying, Al. Uh, let me first argue on your side, uh, but not on the grounds that you argued. Uh, look, uh, the BJP has already got maximum seats in four, five, six states, and therefore it is unlikely to get any additional seats or even those number of seats there. It's just a simple question of electoral cycle that you can't win 25 seats out of 25 every time. Therefore, I think the main theater of politics now in the next five years is not going to be these three, four, five states, but the states where the BJP has not really done so well, which is that, uh, which, is, which are these states in South and East, which are currently ruled by the parties which we have been talking about. And therefore, I think the main confrontation definitely is going to be between these two sets of parties, the BJP on the one hand and the regional parties in these four or five states. However, the question is not about just these <coughs> electoral calculations. The question also is about the ability of the BJP to retain its decent hold over the electorate over five years' time. And just as Jim gave this example of three elections uh, which were sweeping and still the election, uh, the next election they were swept out, uh, we have in more recent history, the Manmohan Singh government, which nobody thought would be re-elected and was re-elected. So to wit, I don't see any reason why a slightly more clever, shrewd and calculating government of Mr. Narendra Modi not get re-elected next time. But anyway, this is somewhat on the lighter side. This question that you raised about uh, what is wrong if there is a Hindutva party coming to power. Uh, I am not going to get into the question about the uh, Bishop of, Archbishop of England or whoever it is. The question is about this nature, the character of India's society and politics. Uh, it's not even about Hindu communalism or Hindu tour as such. It is a question of how do you constitute the political community called India. And that is a contested issue all through. Coming, BJP coming to power is one thing, and BJP pursuing a certain political agenda is another thing. What some of us here have been talking about is the question of whether BJP would pursue a certain political agenda of reconstituting that political community in India, or will they simply be happy, like the earlier NDA government in 1999, to run the government for five years, do a few things, and leave it at that? So I think uh, we might have differences of opinion on whether BJP is coming to power is good or not. But let us be clear about how we define the terrain of that contestation. And finally, this question about payback. Yes, absolutely, that is going to be the question. Uh, and maybe we will find out its echoes in the new budget of the government. But as you yourself implied, obviously, the agenda of the government would be first to satisfy and keep at bay the corporate class and be the middle class. Because while the silent majority actually voted simply by not voting for the Congress party, the voluble majority of the mid voluble sections of the middle class are really the sections which have been defining how the discourse of politics is conducted. So Modi will probably also make sure that that middle class is kept happy 
at least to begin with in the near future. Uh, afterwards, of course, he will have to uh, follow certain plans as Christoph was talking about. Uh, I will stop here because maybe Jim and uh, uh, Sudipta will have to say something about it. Thanks. Jim, issues. would you like to go next? Well, asked about seven autocrats from the state level going to Delhi to demand non-autocratic government at the national <laughs> level. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, that I can imagine the scene. The only problem is he may not, the, this, this particular government may not be inclined to behave as those autocrats would like. I think what will happen is that the uh, the chief ministers like Naveen Patnaik, Jai Lalita, Mamata, constantly whining, whinging, complaining about the wretched central government under Manmohan Singh. They may, may now discover how nice that government was compared to what they have to deal with now. But um, uh, they may, may realize that trips to New Delhi en masse to request uh, democratic treatment may not yield much payback. Is is on payback, payback to the donors who gave a billion dollars with a B, a billion dollars to the BJP to conduct its campaign, uh, what sort of payback will they get? Um, I think the, there are two kinds of payback that are imaginable. They'll, they'll probably get some of each, but the balance may be is, is important. Uh, the first kind of payback they'll get uh, are uh, specific um, uh, concessions specific benefits being targeted on specific companies or specific individuals who head companies who've given large amounts of money. We've already actually begun to see this, and we've begun to see the, the stock prices of certain Indian companies rising remarkably after the result was known because it was expected that this would happen. That's a kind of ad, ad hominem kind of thing. That's Mrs. Indira Gandhi's version of economic liberalization in the early 1980s. You find a few friendly big shots and, and pump a lot of money in their direction, and then you have professors at Princeton calling it economic liberalization, which it's not. Um, the, um, the other kind of payback is to undertake uh, second generation economic reforms, which are uh, desired by many uh, in, in the private sector in India and internationally, uh, and are sometimes rather difficult to undertake. And the initial signals that we have uh, suggest that they will go very slowly in that area. Uh, and indeed, economic ch uh, policy reform in India always has been slow, even in the 91, except for a few weeks in early 1997 when Dewey allowed Chidambaram, who was a neoliberal, off the leash. And for a few weeks, Chidambaram liberalized all sorts of things. He did more liberalizing in a few weeks than the, uh, the BJP governments of Mr. Vajpayee did in six years. But uh, otherwise, economic reform has been, you know, very slow, and, and, and this will get up the nose of the private sector in general in India and elsewhere. It'll get up the nose of the World Bank and so on, if it happens. But maybe they'll, maybe they'll head up. And now finally, is Ram Guha right? Is, uh, is Congress finished? Well, we don't know. I don't, I think it's rather unlikely Congress is utterly finished, but, um, uh, so uh, Ram Guha is a good friend of mine, but he, he doesn't mind a disagreement. Uh, I think Congress's secret weapon now, the secret way to recovery, is the misgovernment which we can expect from the BJP and its prime minister, if indeed that, that's what we get. We, we don't know what we're going to get. Um, but. Suhas, uh, this is not like 2009. The, this was a sweep. This is a landslide. 2009 was a victory that fell short of being a landslide. Because it's a sweep, because it's a landslide, aspirations now of this government are much higher than they were of the UPA government in 2009. And so this is a problem for the new government in Delhi. Uh, trying to meet colossal aspirations is going to be tough. And so we know that certain of those aspirations, one in particular, are, is completely impossible to, to meet. And that is the rapid generation of very large numbers of jobs. It just doesn't happen anywhere. Uh, and so the historical record would suggest to Al that, in the, that we should probably expect the BJP to lose the election of 2019. 
and you should get yourself down to a betting shop. You can't do this in New York. You get yourself down to a betting <laughs> shop and put 10 quid on, on uh, the BJP to lose. Don't, the, the thing is we don't know who's going to win because the regional parties could re reap the benefit instead of Congress because the regional parties, even though they won more seats than they've ever won before at this election, they didn't win any seats in the two biggest states, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, where they are in a position to win big time next time round. Thanks. And the last quick word to yeah. Sir Dipta. Um, I wanted to make just two points very quickly. The first is to expand a little bit on the question of the um, you know, quick ascent of Modi. Uh, in our discussion earlier, I said that uh, you know, dissatisfaction with the Congress is not new. Although some people would say that the, uh, there is, was a general feeling that corruption has uh, gone beyond a certain kind of threshold. But I think this kind of stench of corruption has been around Congress for a very long time. But I think there are two or three things which happened in the run-up to the elections which we should keep in mind. I think the Anna Hazari movement uh, performed a historical function in the sense that you know sometimes you have this kind of free-floating general dissatisfaction with a government, but it needs a sort of move by somebody to give it coherence and a certain kind of center. So I think the Anna Hazari movement did that. But the Anna Hazari movement was supported, everybody knows, uh, by two types of forces. You know, some people were explicitly pro-BJP, and some people were very <coughs> fiercely anti-Congress, but who were not pro-BJP. These were the people who were mobilized for a very brief moment by the rise of the Aam Admi Party. And I think what the Aam Admi Party did to itself and to Indian politics in the meanwhile has played a very important role in <clears throat> the victory of Modi, because I think it mobilized that force and it betrayed that force, betrayed in the sense that you know, it proved to even that force that it was something which could not be trusted with power. And that force, you know, looking around for candidates, did not want to go back to the Congress and came to Modi. That's my reading of what happened at that level. And one very last point, centralizing of power, I think, is a double-edged thing. And I expect, uh, let me put it this way, that you know, it it increases the possibility of effectiveness, but it also increases the, the possibility of vulnerability. Because uh, this is something that happened with Mrs. Gandhi as well, that if you concentrate power excessively in yourself, then you must remember that if something goes wrong, then the responsibility for that would also come to your door. And I think because of that, Modi's inclination to concentrate power also makes him you know, potentially both more effective and in the long run, more vulnerable. Thank you very much. And on that note, I hope you will all join me in giving a very warm thanks to our panel for, a, for a rich discussions. I suspect we will ret be returning to these themes at many points in years to come. So thank you. Thank you.